Dr. Wolvenhorst, uh, could you explain how women can still receive compassionate and necessary medical treatment from pregnancy complications without their provider performing in an abortion? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the question. I think that, um, as I said earlier in my testimony, um, when women experience complications, and in my career I have had literally hundreds of women, both here and in other countries, have complications requiring delivery. Um, when you are performing a procedure to save the life of the mother, it is not morally considered uh, an abortion, and therefore it is ethically permissible. Um, compassionate care means that you consider the circumstances carefully, you act in the best interest of both patients. If the death of the unborn child is a result of your intervention, um, that is a, a tragic outcome. But nonetheless, our priority is to uh, save the life of the mother um, and preserve her functioning, and that can be accomplished without performing an abortion. Uh, Dr. Scott, uh, there's been discussion of long-term health impacts of complications from pregnancy. Uh, data suggests that both chemical and surgical abortions can cause adverse and life-threatening health impacts. Um, can you e briefly explain and discuss the possible complications and impact on health of women that can arise from abortions, including surgical abortions or the use of the abortion pill? Yes, sir. Thank you for that question. So in my 30 years um, practicing uh, caring for women, I've cared for many women who have been harmed by abortion. I've cared for a woman who died of a second trimester um, abortion from sepsis. I have, um, in my practice, another young girl died from sepsis after a first trimester surgical abortion in which her uterus had been perforated. Um, I've cared for many, many women who have explained to me that their anxiety and depression um, is due to their unresolved guilt over an abortion. I trust those women to tell me what the cause of their concerns are. I've seen women who self-harm. Um, I've seen women who turn to substance and alcohol use and abuse um, due to this um, guilt that they have. Um, regarding chemical abortion, um, and I would like to state that, so that everyone is aware, the United States does not have any federal mandates to report any data about abortion. We do not know how many abortions occur, we do not know the complications, and we certainly don't know the deaths, um, because as I reported, it's well known that mental health deaths can follow abortion, and our CDC does not try to make that linkage at all. Um, Countries that have made this linkage have documented far higher um, mental health deaths in the year following abortion compared to childbirth, including six times as many suicides. But regarding chemical abortion, the industry tells us it's safer than Tylenol. They're comparing Tylenol overdose deaths to the um, undercounted deaths from chemical abortion. There's no comparison. Women assume they mean normal Tylenol use. They don't realize that they're comparing it to deaths that happen from overdoses. Um, the abortion industry tells us about the complications they know about, but my experience has been, because the women have been assured it is so safe, when they have a complication, they do not return to the abortion provider. They come to me as their gynecologist or they come to the emergency room in distress. And so when we look at good quality records linkage studies that detect all chemical abortions and all subsequent events, we find five to 6% of these women present to an emergency room within a month. Uh, approximately the same number will require surgery because their bodies cannot evacuate all of the dead tissue. And I am still caring for these complications in Texas, even though we've had abortion limitations for quite some time, because these drugs are circulating in the state to try to circumvent our state laws and provide abortions um, to these unfortunate women. Yeah. Dr. Wibbenhaus, uh, in your opinion, how can we approach reducing mortality rates from pregnant women? And you might also touch on the fact that why is unrestricted abortion not a solution to this issue? Thank you for the question. The solution to maternal mortality, and I've been working in this area globally and in the United States for many years, is to improve health care, health education, 
and to increase support to pregnant women. Abortion does nothing to address any of those issues. The main causes of maternal mortality have been for years, and in the most recent CDC data from 2021, are deaths from cardiovascular causes, infection, um, embol embolus, and so on and so forth. Abortion will not reduce those deaths. You, there is no argument and no paper anywhere that shows that abortion reduces maternal mortality. There are studies that purport to do so, but when you look at the essence of the studies, what they're saying is that, well, if you reduce the number of women at r risk by performing abortions in them, that somehow reduces the number of mortalities. In point of fact, we cannot predict exactly who will have a poor outcome. We cannot predict who will have an adverse maternity outcome. And so that asks the question, how many, what percent of high-risk pregnancies should we abort? 20%, 30%, 40%? I think the other issue, um, uh, really relates to uh, community um, and uh, civil society engagement in terms of helping women to have better outcomes for their pregnancies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 